Showtime! Welcome to the show. I'm Brent Holland, and welcome, one and all, to the show. It's been a long week for you. You've worked hard. It's time to treat yourself. Take this time for yourself. Get in your most comfy chair. Kick your feet back. Get the coffee going. Get the tea going or a beverage of choice. As usual, I drove past Lake Ontario tonight on my regular route to the studio. I looked at the sun setting. I was ever cognizant of the wonderful, peaceful country I live in, Canada. Now, this isn't luck, however. This piece has been bought and paid for by all those who honor us by donning a uniform. I am ever grateful for their sacrifice and want to dedicate this show to Private Andrew Miller, a medic in the Canadian Forces in Afghanistan who was rushing to the aid of children in duress and was murdered by an IED. Andrew was 21 years old. Andrew, you will never be forgot. Now, the Nazis. Tonight's subject matter. To quote Indiana Jones, I hate these guys, folks. I'll be honest. I hate these guys. And to quote Sean Connery's character from the same movie, they are the slime of humanity. The biggest slime of them all, Adolf Hitler. Now, I've always been curious how such a mediocrity of a human being filled with hate, virtually a coward in the First World War, a talentless artist, could fool so many people and rise to such great heights where common people, now I'm presuming, with functioning brains and the ability to know right from wrong, could murder an estimated 11 million human beings. Now, I say estimated because the Nazi genocide factories were moving at such a pace, it's quite possible and probable that that number is actually higher. This is what is now known as the Holocaust or Shoah. So just how did Hitler come to mesmerize all those who followed in blind obedience? Our guest tonight, David King, in his new book, The Trial of Adolf Hitler, The Beer Hall Putsch, and the rise of Nazi Germany just may have some answers. David King is the New York Times best-selling author of Death in the City of Light. If you haven't read this book, folks, get it. Trust me on that one. He's a Fulbright scholar with a master's degree from Cambridge University. David taught European history at the University of Kentucky. Now, film rights to the book I just mentioned, Death in the City of Light, have been sold to a major Hollywood studio, and his Vienna 1814 book was previously optioned for a television miniseries. His books have been translated into more than a dozen languages. Putsch, by the way, folks, P-U-T-S-C-H, means a violent attempt to overthrow the government. Kind of a coup. I'd like to welcome David King to the show, all the way from Kentucky. David, thanks for joining us, and thank you for this book. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much, my friend. I'm going to begin with a quote from the book, because this stuck out to me, and um, it, it's pretty mesmerizing, the whole book, folks. And you're going to love this book when you get it, because it's meticulous, but it's also written in such a way, David's unique flair, if you will, his ability to put it all together as a story, this is a story in itself, and it's going to answer a lot of questions for you. Okay, the quote goes, The trial of Adolf Hitler is not the story of his rise to power, but rather an episode that helped make that rise possible. Hitler was not persecuted as the law demanded. We're going to get into that. The court slapped him with the absolute minimum penalty, and then instead of deporting him, ruled in favor of parole. He returned to where he had left off, though by that time he was much more dangerous to the Republic. Now, David, is there an analogy for the young folks that are listening? My demographic is primarily students. Is there an analogy we could use from what's happening today or in recent past that we could look at the Nazi movement, how it began, and say it's kind of like that? Ooh, that is a good question. Um, you know, I, I, there, there are probably a lot of ways you could take that um, question. And 
I guess when I was writing it, I was just so focused on the story of, you know, of Hitler and, and this, tri- this incredible trial where the authorities had him. They had him, and he admits he's guilty, and yet, you know, as you said, you know, it's, this, is, this, is the, this is the moment they had him. He admits he's guilty, and yet he is not locked up, nor even deported. And he should have been, because the law said if you commit high treason and you are a foreigner, Hitler being Austrian, not German, he's a foreigner, he should have been deported. So, but yeah, I, I think you could take it a lot of ways. I mean, you see a lot, you see so much hatred today, so much, you know, playing on emotions, so much playing to our fears, and I was able to, you know, if you say you have all these enemies, you have A, and A, B, C, D, E, five different enemies, instead of treating each one as five different enemies, so Hitler would say, just make them all one. Make them all one enemy and, and then and defeat it that way. And I think you do see a lot of this uh, in this horrific rise of anti-Semitism coming back yet again. Uh, yeah, I think there's probably a lot of ways you could we could take this, uh, unfortunately. You know, I had Alan Dershowitz on the show and we were talking about the rise of anti-Semitism and I said, you know, Alan, I said, everybody says prostitution is the oldest vocation in the world. I said, I don't think so. I think there's something that predates that. And he said, what? And I said, anti-Semitism. It's been around forever, and it goes in waves, and we are riding a crest right now, folks, that anti-Semitism is the highest it has ever been in the world. Let's take a look at this thing, and what caused the rise of Hitler? Maybe a good place to start would be the Treaty of Versailles, October 21st, 1919. Could you talk a little bit about that? Yes, yes, that's, that's a great place to start. Because if you think of this, okay, the war's over, World War One is over, and uh, the Germans, had, you know, they, they thought they were winning, and the, and, and the news was so heavily censored that the defeat came as a surprise. I mean, they knew about the victories, but again, because of the censorship, the defeats, not so much. And so the surrender became as a bit of a surprise. And then here comes the peace treaty at Versailles, which uh, was... Oh, what a, it, it was really taken as a humiliation for Germany because, uh, again, Germany had borrowed a lot of money because wars are expensive, and they had borrowed a lot of money to fight the war, hoping to pay this off later by territory that they could seize from other countries. And um, it didn't work out that way. Instead, Germany lost territory, they lost populations, and their military was limited to 100,000 soldiers. That's it, 100,000 soldiers. Um, other restrictions on what, what sort of material you could have. And to make it all worse, Germany had to admit that they were the single cause of the war. The only, you know, they were the cause, the war guilt clause, hated war guilt clause, and then they had to pay billions. I, I, I price to be determined later, which was eventually determined, and it was a lot. So you had this um, very unpopular treaty signed. I mean, there were rumors that the German... The diplomats that were going to sign it were going to blow their brains out before they signed, or maybe, or would they sign it and then blow their brains out? I mean, this was a sort of discussion. Flags were half mast. I mean, this was a, taken as a national humiliation. And so Hitler is, you know, he's able to really, there's a whole myth that grows up that Germany was not really defeated in the war, they were stabbed in the back. The, the, it wasn't a military defeat, it was a defeat by the politicians. And Germany, you know, still a young country. Germany as a country is only 50 years old, thereabouts, at this time. And they have their first republic. And so the, when the republic comes in, the, the politicians, because the monarchy was, thrown, was uh, overthrown at the end of the war, they are the ones to sign the treaty. So this Weimar Republic, as it's called after, you know, um, this is, they, comes in uh, with this big, big mark against it from the get-go. And so Hitler is, has a lot of grievances, and um, and by and by 23, when the when the putsch comes, the currency is just going crazy. Um, it used to be four marks to a dollar on when World War One started, and by the end of the war, it's eight marks. And then by 23, when the French invade the Ruhr, it's like 12,000 marks, and then it, it just keeps falling. Uh, 100,000 marks, 500,000 marks, a million marks. 500 million marks, a trillion marks. I mean, it, it bottoms out at 6.7 trillion marks to a dollar. So people are, you know, you, if you saved your whole life, a lot of people are wiped out. I mean, you what, what could have bought something incredible before the war, you know, you, you 
you won't buy coffee now. I mean, cabbage is 12 billion marks at the time of the push, or, or maybe 10 billion if you get a good deal. I mean, it's, it's, it's a catastrophe. People are thinking this is the end of capitalism. And so this is the, the climate where Hitler comes in, and he, 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 he can tell people, here's what's wrong, or rather, who is that wrong? And really just find a, he needs an enemy, and he will, he will find, you know, unfortunately, enemies. There was a socialist government that took over. There was hyperinflation, as you just mentioned, happening. Germany was just churning out money, just printing it. So, folks, uh, maybe perhaps a good analogy is, is think of Confederate money during the Civil War. I mean, it's, it's valueless. It's just paper. There's nothing behind it to actually give it any constitution. Um, you've got the middle class. It's pretty much decimated. There's no work left. Everybody's unemployed. My God, that sounds like today, doesn't it? <laughs> it's kind of scary, actually. Frightening. <laughs> it's frighteningly close. So this is why we study history, folks, by the way. We study to look for precedents so that we don't make the same mistakes over and over again. And it also allows us to look for solutions to current day problems because chances are somebody's been through it before. Good example, check out our archives, the show with Ted Sorensen. He's the fellow that wrote the letter to Khrushchev to get him to back down. So we have a precedent. If we run into another nuclear standoff, maybe there's a way out this time because somebody's gone through it before. Okay, back to Hitler and the Nazi party. So you've got this young guy comes out of nowhere. How does he become part of this National Socialist German Workers' Party, i.e. the Nazi Party? How does he rise to become the leader of this party? It's, it's a, it is a, 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 a very surprise. I mean, it's just surprise after surprise um, with this, because Hitler, he, he arrives in Munich. I mean, he's, you know, as you know, in Vienna, he's very hard up. He would even, he even plays up how hard up he was. Um, you know, to, to appeal to the people about, you know, how he's homeless and very poor. But he comes to Munich like that. Um, he's actually on the run, um, it turns out. Uh, he's, this was not mentioned at the trial, but he's, really, he's covering it up here. He's also covering it up with Mein Kampf. But he, he was, you might say, dodged the draft he, to you know, serve the Austrian army. He does not do that. And he comes to Munich to, to avoid that. He ends up getting in trouble for that, too. Um, the documents are there. And he also wants to be a painter, because Munich at this time um, was a very sophisticated, cultured city. I mean, a city of painters and poets and dreamers, bohemians. And yet it's going to become this place, you know, instead of being a city of Kandinsky and Klee, it's going to be a city of Hitler and Himmler. So that's kind of an I mean, incredible shock. So Hitler comes in there, and during all this chaos, he arrives in 1913, I should say. And, um, and after the war... And from the chaos of the First World War, and then Munich has a revolution, uh, which eventually, for a brief period, the communists will take over. And so Hitler is still, you know, he's not anywhere near the Nazis. He's not with the Nazis yet. I mean, that, that's another surprise um, historians have discovered. I mean, this is the 1990s when they found out that Hitler's first moves in politics were actually with the socialist regime. You know, that was that was not known, but this German historian has, has I think, proved you know, showing that um, with some of the documents he's found. And um, so Hitler is, he ends up going, how he gets in with this small party, um, they'll eventually become the Nazis. They're not, they're not called that yet, they're still National Socialists. And it's after the trial they really become known you know, as Nazis, he's shortened as Nazis. Um, but he, he goes there as he's working for the military. To, to kind of uh, spy on these parties on the far right because they're looking for the Germans need to find a way to win back the workers, they say, because a lot of the workers had gone towards the left after the, um, through the chaos of the war and the revolution. And so the army's looking for uh, groups they can support. And so Hitler goes at a meeting just to check it out and ends up, ends up uh, joining it. That, I mean, that seems to be the case now. I mean, he, uh, but a lot of things in Mein Kampf, I mean, turn out to be you know, uh, not true. I mean, so uh, it's, we'll, we'll be finding uh, new things about Hitler probably for the rest of our lives as uh, people discover things and, and question things. Like, <clears throat> like, for example, he used to say Hitler got his anti-Semitism in Vienna. Um, but now a lot of days, I think a lot of historians would say it's, it's probably more like a Munich uh, just because 
he, he, really, he really has reasons, as we say in the book, to exaggerate his uh, anti-Semitism, the lineage of his anti-Semitism and putting it in Munich, and putting it in Vienna, what we think is actually Munich. David, was he truly anti-Semitic, or did he just see that as a way? You, you, we asked before, who was he going to blame? And we know he ended up blaming the Jews. Was he truly anti-Semitic, or did he just use that as a scapegoat for his own convenience, as a way to gain power? This is a big debate among historians. The first few, like Alan Bullock, who was a uh, professor at, at Oxford, at St. Catherine's College, he, he saw Hitler as just this Machiavellian and just kind of... Uh, you know, uh, opportunistic, just exploiting this. As he says, Mein Kampf, you know, the, you know, about how you could treat your enemies. However, I think, I, I kind of inclined to think that he really, I mean, I, I think he believed it. I, I really do. And that's kind of uh, Trevor Roper, another Oxford historian, is, is with the opposite. No, no, he said he, he believes it. And I think I, I, I'm on that end of it. I, I really think he did. Because if you read I'm Mein Kampf, there. I mean, I'm with because he, he would not have done the Holocaust. He had achieved his power to continue that on and create some kind of um, mass machine to eradicate a whole people and gays and gypsies and anybody he didn't like. I mean, there was psychosis there with their question. Sorry to interrupt I mean, you. No, no, no. I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's, it, it's just like, and that, that was one of the things that uh, Trevor Roper said when he was like, no, 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 he, I, he believes it. It's just reading this uh Mein Kampf, and just just reading that, reading the German, and just seeing, he says, "Whoa!" Just seeing it. You know, he, this is, seems like a person um, who believes um, what, what he's saying. And, and a lot of people, if you look at descriptions around him, um, like at the trial or, or from uh, all the memoirs, I mean, almost. I mean, he, he, okay, he was an actor. I mean, as Bullock, and Bullock even kind of revised his view in one of his later books, uh, um, when he did Hitler and Stalin. He was kind of okay. He had a little more nuanced view than he did this first time when he. Uh, wrote his first book in the 50s when he just had the Nuremberg files uh, from the Nuremberg trial. The National yeah. Socialist German's Worker Party in 1923, folks, had 56,000 members. Now, approximately 62 million people total was the population in Germany in 1923. 56,000 members. Think about that. Think about the size of that. That's scary. That's a movement and a half. So we're in 1923, David. Hitler looks to Mussolini. Mussolini has just taken over the government there in Italy. So all of a sudden, he's a role model for Hitler. And Hitler says, oh, if he can do it, I can do it too. When did the planning for the push start? There were a couple times I, I wondered, because there are a couple times earlier in 23, for sure, when it looks like they're, they're starting to set things in motion, but yet something doesn't work and they don't actually move uh, but for the when they actually do move, like for that it's in November 1923, and they've been planning for. So when they actually started, I mean, uh, it'd be interesting to see if you could find it, find out where they first started on it. But, there, I, uh, but for when they actually move, it's it's not very well planned um, at that time because they, they were it's like November 8th when they march into the beer hall, um, and they originally were going to do it a few days later. Because um, you know November 11th is a nice day for the anniversary of the you know for the armistice in World War One, that would have been a good day, but uh, he found out uh, that there was going to be an important meeting held at the uh, beer hall, and everybody was going to be there. All the leaders of Bavaria were going to be there, so he thought now is a good time to act. We can march in and force these leaders to march on Berlin. So he he really speeds things up. And he forces everybody to go ahead when they have not really planned it out. So it's you could say a couple of days before they they do it. Um, it's when they it's just not. It's just, I mean, Hitler is kind of like this. He can kind of force. All right, we got to go. Let's go now, now. And um, you know, but, well, we're not quite ready. And um, but uh, you know, there, there was a time in May, like a big um, time, where it looked like they were trying to do things. And there were a few instances like that earlier in '23 too. Um, where they may or may not have been trying to do something. I mean, I don't think it's really clear. Um, but they, they, they were, there were certainly a lot of grumblings, and they were a lot of talk, let's, let's act, let's act. And then all of a sudden they, they do act. And we actually found this, um, I found an invitation to the beer hall on the, on the night, which I was, was wild to come across on for the actual beer hall um, 
Butch, uh, November 8, 1923, when uh, Gustav von Kahr, who was the leader of Bavaria, was going to give the talk, inviting everybody to come out. And that's, that's where Hitler marches in. And By right, the way, folks, that pit, there's a picture of that in the book. So it's full of pictures. It's full of historical content as well. So sorry to interrupt you once again. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, yeah, there's a Gustav von Kahr, who was kind of uh, who's the leader of Bavaria, given uh, a lot of executive powers because, because of the chaos. And, um, I mean, it turns out, I mean, another irony is when Hitler marches in to the beer hall and fires his pistol in the air, declares the national revolution as broken out, it really seems that what he has uh, messed up their plans because they, are, uh, they, they seem to be uh, working to try to do something. Because, um, again, Bavaria and Berlin had a lot of issues at this time. Um, you know, big insult in Bavaria was to call somebody like a Prussian or Prussian pig or, you know, so they, I mean, they were, there were a lot of people wanting to uh, go after the Republican regime in, in Berlin. And Hitler really seemed to kind of uh, mess up their plans by his action and um, forcing them to act. So they were, they were kind of upset. <laughs> David, how many people were involved? I'm thinking you're going to need quite a few people. You just can't walk in with a handful, a dozen people or something and take over you know, a beer hall full of people, and then declare a revolution. Was there a quasi army behind him at all at this point? He, yes, yes, yes. There was. He had um, uh, earlier. Uh, okay, this is November. It's a couple months before in September. Hitler had he had he had the stormtroopers, of course, uh, um, already. Let, you know, Goering was, was leading them at this time, and they were. Um, but they had joined an alliance with these other fighting societies. There were two other fighting. Um, Societies had come together in the Kaufbund, or like this combat league, and they were going to um, work together. Um, and, and because again, it's, and this was after the when the when the putsch failed. I mean, when, when Hitler becomes a joke, I mean, they're laughing at him um, because you know if you're going to take over a government, shouldn't you be in a military barracks or maybe a government office, perhaps somewhere besides the beer hall? And if you're going to take over Berlin, maybe you should do it. You know, what, what, in Munich, that's, that's, that's a long way away. Um, so I mean, then uh, so after the the putsch fails, I mean, people were even saying that it's this it seems to be the end of Hitler. The New York Times said this is the end of the Nazi Party when it fails. Um, and the Frankfurt Zeitung, another another um, well-informed observer, said this is wrote, wrote the obituary of the party. I mean, it looked like this was the end of Hitler. Hitler thought it was the end of him. <laughs> He was really depressed after the, the putsch failed and 20 people had died. He's like, who's going to listen to me now? And you can see this in the prison when people uh, go and talk to him, and he's just depressed and on a hunger strike, and he thinks it's over, and it probably you know, could, probably should have been had it not been for the trial. It's too bad the hunger strike wasn't successful for him. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, I, mean, I don't like this guy, folks. Is, you know, and if somebody's offended because I'm being disrespectful to the Nazis and Hitler, tough luck. <laughs> tough luck. <laughs> it's not going to happen from this host, anyways. The book is called "The Trial of Adolf Hitler: The Beer Hall Putsch and the Rise of Nazi Germany." Our guest tonight, David King. Okay, so you've got Jewish hostages. He's taken. He's got General Eric Lundenarf, and he's behind Hitler. He's kind of an iconic leader. People look up to him, and he kind of gave, unfortunately, credibility to Hitler and his movement. Can we talk a little bit about the hostages that were taken and General Eric Lundenarf? Yeah, this was, this was something else, because yeah, Hitler was, you know, think it down and out, you know, an aspiring painter, uh, painting like, like kitsch, really, I mean... Um, and it's like he, all of a sudden, he's with this major general in the First World War. I mean, you got Ludendorff Hindenburg. Those are the two big names, almost like dictatorial power over Germany at the end of the war. And Ludendorff is even with Hitler. So this was, a, this was a something, because and Ludendorff, at this point, becoming this idol for the far right, uh, because he's uh, almost seen as a military genius. Uh, the left and the center, like, well, Ludendorff, with his very ambitious campaigns, may have caused Germany to lose the war. Um, so he's a divisive figure already, but, but on the far right, he's idolized. And um, 
so he, yeah, he's a big help for, for Hitler. And in irony at the trial, everybody's talking about Ludendorff at first because, wow, how could Germany, this, this general, he's on trial now for high treason. But Ludendorff takes a stand. It just does not come out well at all. He's blaming everybody except himself, whereas Hitler, on, their, on the other hand, is taking all responsibility. says, yeah, I did this. I did it. Um, you know, um, but the real traitors, I'm not a traitor. The traitors, that's the government in Berlin. And, you know, people are eating this up. So, yeah, so Ludendorff is a big help for Hitler just because of his name, his contacts that he has. I mean, he seems to be turning his villa. His wife wrote a, a fun memoir um, talking about how Ludendorff was turning their villa outside Munich into this, um, um, like, this, you know, a center for Nazi intrigue. And Ludendorff would go out there and putter about in the garden with his roses and water his flowers and, and pretend to be aloof from the conspiracy. But he, was, he, he often did that. I mean, he, <laughs> he had a nice cover, it seemed, for, for his actions. But, but, you, but, yeah, so the guy Ludendorff involved comes there to the beer hall when Hitler fetches him. And, um, and, and among the other many crimes they do besides high treason is they, uh, they, they, you know, they smash up uh, a socialist newspaper. They take Jewish hostages. And we don't even know how many they took. I mean, I've, um, I, I tried to trace it down. And there's this uh, memoir, um, unpublished memoir from the – when, when, when Hitler marches through the streets, he has a guy in arm in arm with him. Um, Schwarzenegger Richter is his name. They're marching, up. and, and Schwarzenegger Richter gets shot, so the bullet misses Hitler by you know about a you know a little over a foot, uh, or a foot, um, and it kills the other guy. But but Schwarzenegger Richter's valet wrote an unpublished memoir who talks about um, some of the hostages. You know, not, not anything a lot of details, just just the number of people. They would go out and they would they would grab. Um, I mean, there were there were these um, people going out and looking for Jews to attack, and organized. The smug was not organized; just people uh, like one guy I uh, was reading in um, in the files, the police files, were very. You know, uh, he, he said he was out drinking, and just joins his buddies. They just go out for look for Jews and quote enemies of the people to attack, and um, and when they couldn't find any in the restaurants and hotels. Uh, some people even, you know, they pull out the, the phone book and start looking for names that sound Jewish or look at doorbells. Okay, last name. Oh, okay, does he sound Jewish? And so they will, they will grab people and bring them back to the beer hall and, uh, and they eventually let, let go. Um, but they, you know, it's just a night, night of terror. You know, um, just I mean, the, the editor for the newspaper, you know, he, he's not at his house, but his the, the stormtroopers march in there and start pushing around his wife and his daughters, and they, they take his son-in-law and bring him back to the beer hall too. And at one point, I mean, Goering, his his plan for marching uh, the town council is also kidnapped. Is they're going to march him in uh, in their march towards the city, and if the authorities don't release the Nazis, they're arrested. They were going to, they were, you know, they could always shoot these people or use them as leverage for whatever they want. But uh, it's. Uh, and, and again, another scandal for the trials. A lot of those crimes aren't included in the trial. They just focus purely on the high treason, and they don't worry about the death of four policemen or the or these sorts of things. You know, the kidnapping of uh, Jewish citizens, or when they rob the printing press of trillions of marks. So, you know, none of that's. Uh, they just push that aside and focus just on the treason. The JFK Assassination, the definitive book by Brent Holland. From inside the Oval Office to Davy Plaza, first-person witness accounts. Order yours right now. www.nightfrightshow.com We're going to get the trial in, in just a second. I just want to tell you who we're speaking with, folks. The trial of Adolf Hitler is the name of the book, The Beer Hall Push and the Rise of Nazi Germany. David King is the author and our guest tonight. Okay, so the government puts down the push. They arrest everybody. They throw them in jail. The trial's about to begin. Now, we call the OJ trial, folks, the trial of the century. David, was this similar in its popularity, at least in Germany? The reason why I ask is because there's international press all over this thing. And I'm just wondering if that could be a similar type of an analogy we could use in terms, O.J.'s not Hitler, folks. 
Okay, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm talking about in terms of publicity, in terms of people being curious as to what's going on. I, I, it, it was certainly a sensation. I mean, uh, people at the time were saying, "Oh, this is the this is the biggest trial Munich's ever had, or the biggest trial in years," and uh, it's a sensation from the get-go. Um, a scandal once they get started. And looking back, you know, we'd say it's a catastrophe, uh, but it was certainly a sensation. And reporters are coming, you know all over Germany, it's France, Switzerland, Spain, uh, United States, and, you know, all over the world. Argentina, we had some reporters from Argentina. And uh, it's, I mean, this is Hitler, and, and it's reported in great detail. And so you're going to see Hitler, instead of talking to a beer hall in Munich, he's talking to the biggest audience he's ever had in his life. Um, this is, and so at the beginning of the trial, you know, he's kind of the secondary player, it seems. His name misspelled, Hitler with two T's sometimes, um, or his background, you know, Dr. Hitler or Hitler von, or von Hitler. And then the person thinks he's very, because of all the talk about his military courage, so, you know, they think he's like von Hitler. Um, that, that'll be happen less and less, those mistakes as the trial goes on. <clears throat> but yeah, it's, it's a sensation. I mean, the people are, are coming in, and the tickets are highly priced. To try to get a ticket to the trial, and I found these nice. Some of these tickets for five. I mean, like in Munich in the archives, it's nice to to see these. I, um, and uh, I tried to to get a copy to print in the book, but it, the copy didn't come out too well. But it was uh, you had to get these special passes to to get in because uh, they, they they were controlled. The judge was in was in charge of that, and you know, he may have well been packing the audience too. I mean, it's uh, the audience was clearly on. Uh, Hitler's side. You can see this from the newspaper reports, even the, the transcript. Uh, you, you know, it will mark Heiterkeit, you know, you know, laughter and merriment, or, you know, um, that's even marked in the, the transcript, which was a wonderful source. I mean, about 3,000 pages, almost 3,000 pages of the German original verbatim dialogue, and with the reporters uh, adding a whole lot more that's not in the transcript, though, you know, how, how Hitler looked and how he acted, and spoke and this theatrical um uh just as you know theatrical a manner that he had and kissing the hands of women um i mean the, the, the trial is like a chaos i mean it looks like to us i mean because it's just the, the um yeah just what, what, what a what a what a catastrophe <laughs> <laughs> by the way folks about the press um in the press you know hitler's little mustache that little thing he had there on his upper lip, below his nose. Well, they referred to that, are you ready, as a <laughs> snot break. And I think that's perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I really do. You know, <laughs> I really do. Uh, and another missed opportunity, Goring, during the putsch, was only wounded. And I say only with all reverence, because, you know, an inch or two closer, and um, it, there could have been a big difference in the Holocaust, because Goring was... A big part of the final solution. Okay, let's go back to the trial. Now, we've got this big trial happening, and all of a sudden, how does Hitler rise from the secondary figure in all of this and lead, uh, leave Ludendorff behind and become the main figure and kind of, I don't know, the champion of the small person, uh, of the little man? How, how, does he, uh, how does he do this? I mean, he's a nothing, and all of a sudden he's... He's raised up to this incredible status that he's appealing to the everyday man. How does he do it? Yeah, it's like well, one thing he did is he, he was he could speak. He could speak, and the judge, you know, had that. You know, there's there's an attempt to try to take this trial and put it behind closed doors. Had they done that, um, you know, this, that, that would have that raised a lot of questions. That would have been, you know, that would not be without problems, but. Hitler would not have had this platform that he had, and, and they, they know that. So immediately, when the when the prosecution like, this movement is behind closed door, you know, the Hitler and the defense, and oh no no no, the, the, the German people need to hear this. And there's a big debate in, um, behind closed doors. You know, should we hold the whole trial there? And um, the judge they, they decide to have it public and move behind closed doors on occasion. And they they have a lot to hide. We can go into that if you like, but. Um, they, and Hitler will exploit that. He, he, he uh, will really take advantage of this opportunity. He, so from his first speech, the first day, he's on there and he speaks hours. 
you know, the reporters would say different times, you know, three hours, some say even four hours. I mean, it's a, several hours he will talk. It's a long speech, and it's taken in detail. And he is um, coming out swinging with this, you know, making no mistake that he's anti-Semitic. He's blaming the Jews from the start. He's blaming Berlin. He's really targeting his audience uh, and speaking to their emotions and their fears and uh, just just ruthlessly uh, doing that. And uh, it goes on and on and on, just talking. And, uh, and people are taking this in. It's uh, reported in great detail. Hitler, folks, just to let you know, during this trial, it was not trial by jury. It was trial by three judges. Were there any Jewish judges also present or anybody of Jewish heritage that was present? Not in the, not on the, not on the bench, and then not um, that I know of uh, among the lawyers. I, I, I uh, think I don't think there was any on on, on here. There, there are some. There, um, some there's a uh, wonderful uh, memoir of a contemporary uh, Jewish lawyer, Hirschberg. Uh, fascinating, fascinating uh, memoir, which I ended up getting hold of. And again, he's just uh, just very, you know, just going after this trial and for so many so many reasons why it's just a such a perversion of justice um and it's it's like never before has uh, justice shown itself to be the whore of fascism he calls it even in bavaria <laughs> he says so i mean it's like uh because it's so but yeah the uh there are a lot of people that are critiquing at the time for just on so many levels on, on where it's not really uh upholding the law as it should. What was the Had reaction they, of the local press? Not so much the international press, but the local press. I mean, here you've got a guy that just tried to overthrow the government. How did they react to that? And was there a change during the trial? Did they become more pro-Hitler as it went on? There, there, um, there's a lot of, a lot of pro-Hitler. Um, there were, the like Berlin socialist papers, there were a couple of those um, that were very critical from the get-go. The communists were very critical from the get-go. Um, Munich, uh, you, had, you, had, you had a lot of, I mean, the right wing was, a lot of right wing papers that were supporting Hitler and how it's a shame how these um, such national heroes like Ludendorff and then Hitler started to be included in this uh, as it goes on, or even on trial. The whole trial is a disgrace, they were saying. So you would see a, a, very, a very polarized view within, within Germany. Uh, and I mean, you'll see one one of the big Munich papers. I mean, was a was in favor of uh, uh, the, the putsch from the get go, but then they actually are are, are, are less so as, as it goes on. Uh, but, but even then, at the end, though, I mean, they're like, well, um, uh, I think there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a whole lot of uh, sympathy on the on the right wing. You could say for sure. Was he being painted as some kind of patriotic? underdog. You know, for me, the whole thing just reminds me of when the godfather of terrorism, Yasser Arafat, gave a speech in the United Nations. I think it was 1974. Folks, he walks into the United Nations, Yasser Arafat, with all this blood on his hands, with a gun belt on. At the United Nations. Now, he was rewarded for his terrorist actions. Are you ready for this? With a standing ovation. This guy reminds me that he may have taken a lesson or two from Hitler. Was it much the same with Hitler? Was he praised and, you know, here comes royalty, let's throw out the red carpet for this guy? Yeah, yes, yes. Uh, and that, that definitely happens more as the trial goes on, as he starts, um, like, he really exploits, um, look at Berlin. Berlin is very unpopular. Uh, in Berlin, you know, like the like uh, Republic as well, or German Republic being very unpopular in, in Bavaria. Uh, but also even uh, like Gustav von Kahr, the Bavarian leader, uh, a lot of people on the far right were, and, and Kahr was on the right, but they were uh, up, getting upset with him because he was not acting, you know, he, he was being portrayed as someone who betray, betrayed Hitler. Um, because... It's at the beer hall, you know, when Hitler marches in, the car's the one speaking. It's car's event. It's supposed to be a rally for car when Hitler arrives at the beer hall. And 
declares the revolution. He, he asks Carr and uh, two other big Bavarian leaders to go in the side room and then negotiate in the side room. And they come out in um, some minutes later, and Carr, oh yes, we we join national revolution. We joining, we're part of it. And so everybody cheers at the beer hall. I mean, Hitler kind of just turns it. The, the audience is heckling Hitler at the beginning of the beer hall. You know, what are you doing? You know, he, he marches in on Carr's talk, and he's full of Carr's supporters. And Hitler just does a speech, and people are in the crowd. I mean, you have a uh, this wonderful archive on. Um, of, of, of eyewitnesses at the beer hall. This is the irony. The Nazis actually collected this um, file, and the American army captured it in '45 at the end of World War II. They captured, uh, they, they helped our keep everything that the Nazis had not burned or got rid of. Thousands, 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 thousands of pages. And I, I ended up copying the entire part on the on the putsch. I have it at home. Um, and the in the in the trial because the Nazis were very interested in this period of. Um, history because the putsch became this big part of the mythology and just eyewitness after eyewitness of this uh the beer hall thing and this people call this like a masterpiece uh when he brings the crowd around to his side well, anyway that's the background so Carr was um supposedly joining it the far right would say and then in his car and his administration though you know that end up shooting him so the right, the right wing is like, what kind of government fires at its own people? What kind of government fires at its own heroes? What kind of government fires at its patriot? You know, so there's a lot of, there's that span. So Hitler is now coming, but poor little Hitler, you know, he's like a martyr. He's standing, he was standing up for the people. He was standing up for the Bavarians. And so Hitler, um, the traitor, you know, against the, the government, against the republic, is starting to come across in the right more as a patriot. And so Hitler, who dodged the draft in Austria, is now being seen as this, uh, like, war hero. I mean, it's, uh, it gets, things get flipped. It's very surreal, some of the reporters would say, <laughs> describing this. His whole history, his whole story is surreal, as far as I'm concerned. That's why we've got to study this, folks, so we don't repeat the same mistakes and allow... Guys like Hitler to come to power know what's going on behind the scenes and, and look for the precedents, look for the repeating patterns so we can stop that cycle of violence and anti-Semitism. Okay, just a couple of things here very quickly. There was a Nazi flag swastika being carried during the putsch. That ended up with some blood on it. Hitler kept that flag, and years later, he would bless all the Nazis walking by with it. He was pretending he was some kind of high, mighty, godlike figure, blessing all the troops as they'd walk by and touching the troops with this flag like they've now been anointed. That's a better way to put it, I suspect. There's another quote from the book, folks. The book is called, by the way, The Trial of Adolf Hitler. It is meticulously researched. The Beer Hall Putsch and the Rise of Nazi Germany, the author, our guest tonight, David King. Okay, the quote from the book, Hitler received wide latitude in what he could say and do. Now, folks, i got to remind you, this is a guy that just tried to do a coup on the government, a revolutionary. As long as he did not reveal sensitive information that might harm Bavarian or German interests, David, can you tell us what that sensitive information he was forced to sit on so he could get his wide latitude and a lighter sentence? Yeah. This, this was something that came as a surprise to me. Uh, because, again, if you read the standard, the, the best biographies uh, of Hitler, and they're, they're, they're wonderful classics, uh, but, uh, but again, look at Hitler's life. It's, the Holocaust, World War II, dictators, there's just so much to cover. So the trial often doesn't get as much as, as it, you know, because you can't write 50,000-page biographies. You know, it will be fun to read, but it might be hard to find a publisher for a book that size. So things fall on the sideline. So the standard view of the judge is that, you know, he likes Hitler. He's a nationalist. And I think that is absolutely true. He likes Hitler. He is a nationalist. But I think there's something else that makes him um, so much more willing to tolerate Hitler and that's, and that's that sensitive information. That was a surprise to me. I think it's because Hitler, he knew some things. And that's one reason why they wanted to go to, another reason for wanting to go to a secret session is because Hitler knew some things. He knew, for example, uh, 
that Germany, I don't want to spoil too much, but the short version is he knew that Germany was not obeying the Versailles Treaty. 100,000 men and the weapons, well, the Germans were hiding these weapons. They're supposed to be turned over you know, to the Allies, but these weapons were being hid, uh, like in churches. They're also being hid in a student society, like, a, like almost like a fraternity. It's more of a dueling society in the basement there. They're being hid. Uh, they were also, instead of having 100,000 men, the, the army was training these fighting societies, like the stormtroopers and the comfortable and the people that we talked about. Um, they were training these people up all against the treaty. And, and uh, this was, I mean, the French papers were very interested in the trial because they kind of suspected this sort of thing, but, they, you know, they, they did that, you know, it was, but they would always go into the secret session to, to sort of this did not get out. And Hitler said, we will not hurt Germany. Well, he meant, you know, we will not reveal these dark secrets. Uh, because, again, the French had marched into the Ruhr in 23 for much less than that, much less than that. So, I mean, they were, the French were very interested. You know, we did not fight World War I, and with all the lives the French lost and all the money they spent just to have it come back, just to have the Germans come back with, you know, Ludendorff and this Prussian nationalism again. We, that's not why we fought the war. So that's like one side of it. The other secret information or sensitive information was how involved the, the Bavarian government was. Like Gustav von Kahr and these people that were scheming and trying to figure out a way to go against, it really seems, scheming and trying to go against Berlin. Um, when Hitler kind of messed things up by marching into the beer hall. When, you know, they were, they were having plans because, again, the currency was going crazy. Germany was in chaos. And Hitler's like, you know, now's our time. We don't want to miss this opportunity. We're, we're marching. Let's go. You know, even when plans weren't ready. Uh, so it's things like that, in, the, in short. What, Hitler knew that, and had he said that, oh, uh, what? I mean, it, it was a scandal in the sense of justice not being done. Uh, this could have been a scandal in uh, international relations had some of this come out. And the old, like I have a, like I have the, the, mm-hmm. the original, not the original, I have a copy of the original um, transcript, 3,000 page Thing but also have some uh, purchased some 1924 transcripts that were published, and they don't have any access to the secret uh, sessions, of course, because they, you know, they cleared the courtroom. No one was allowed in there except for you know a handful of people, and no reporters. Is this and, why there was such a light sentence? He only got five years. He ended up serving only eight and a half months. Months, folks, not years. Eight and a half months out of five years, and. Is this why there was no death penalty as well? Well, you know, there's, there's another level of scandal to this trial. The trial should never have been in Munich. Should never. And the court that it, was hit, it took place, the People's Court, was now illegal. It was unconstitutional. Um, because when the Weimar Republic Constitution was signed, these sorts of local uh, tribunals of justice, like the People's Court, were no longer legal. They should have been. They should not. They should go out of existence, and they will. They kind of strike a compromise in the Hitler trial, and it used to be called the last of it. It's not really the last. Rudolf Hess. Uh, it's also tried in the People's Court. That really does seem to, to be the last one, and, they, and it goes out of existence here in 1924. Uh, so it shouldn't even been in Munich. It should have been in Leipzig. That's where the they, had, they created a special court uh, to deal with these sorts of matters to protect you know matters of treason because there was a lot of cases of treason coming up. Uh, already by 1923 and 24. So the trial should have been, according to the law, it should have been the Leipzig. And had it been there, I, things might have been very different. I mean, it would have just been high tree. I mean, you know, what would have been tried on the death of the policeman? I mean, he could have gotten, um, I've read some like, German scholars, at German law, legal scholars from the, the 20s, you know, critiquing the trial at the time, saying, you know, yeah, that could, it, it, but he's not tried that way. He's not tried for that or the kidnapping. It's just the high treason, and it's in Munich, and it's with uh, this, you know, friendly, friendly tribunal, uh, the, the People's Court. Uh, so he, he gets slapped. I mean, the, the sentence comes out April 1st, kind of appropriate day, um, ironically. And then at 1924, and by December 24, uh, December 20th, 1924, he's, he's out. He's uh, out, and he's back, and he's bigger than ever. And that's the yes. frightening part. They had a chance to squash this little bug, and 
it didn't happen. And you know, this is that, and we know the consequences of this. I mean, time and time again, we look at at places where we could cut off a guy like Hitler from doing the dastardly things he did, and time and time again, those opportunities are missed. And usually, there's political forces behind them all. What led you, David, to investigate this? You've done your previous book, and it's fabulous. Absolutely fabulous as well, folks. What led you to do this book? Well, I started out, um, this is a lecture. I always enjoy doing it when I taught at the University of Kentucky. I mean, I thought I, thought I would do the Beer Hall, uh, Butch, because it, at that time, it had been 30 years since it had been a book. and that, That's a long time. And I was like, and I, 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 I had some ideas of some things that could be done differently. So I thought I would start with that. It's just this chaos, uh, this what looked like the, the apocalypse of you know capitalism. I thought I would do that, and as you know, use the push to understand early 20s Germany. And uh, I was also interested in this like Munich. You know, how did Munich uh, change, uh, become such a, a center of you know from being a, such a sophisticated center into a place that's known for attracting Nazis? I mean, how I mean, if, it, if it happened to Munich, it, who's safe? <laughs> so I was kind of thought I would do that, and then. When I got into it, I realized it would never been a book on the trial. And I couldn't believe that. I couldn't believe it had never been a book. Uh, so I switched into that. Cause, oh. I was like, well, why, why hadn't there been a book? Maybe there aren't any sources. And then I started looking, and I was like, wow, there's incredible sources. You know, transcript and unpublished sources. Hitler's bodyguard, we got his unpublished memoir, and the lady who hid Hitler in her attic when he was on the run from the police, handwritten notes, we got those. And... Uh, Lawyers, the papers of the lawyers, defense and prosecution, unpublished memoir from the. I mean, there are tons of things. Goering's wife um, wrote these letters in Swedish home, and I, I read Swedish. I lived there for a while. Um, my wife is Swedish, and so that was, oh, cool, I'll read that. And um, so, it was wonderful sources. Oh, even the Landsberg, we had the new files from Landsberg Prison during Hitler's stay. That were discovered in the flea market not too long ago. While I was writing *Death in the City Light*, I said, "Oh, that's interesting. I, I I couldn't dream that they would be available." But fortunately, Germany passed a law that they couldn't leave the country because otherwise, you know, some a collector might have come in and swooped them up. Um, so, fortunately, you know, German, German archive got these documents on um, Landsberg Prison that helped us understand Hitler's stay in uh, Landsberg. I mean, this is like a new world. I mean, you could see. Everybody visited Hitler, how long they stayed. And... Folks, what I wanted to tell you about this book is in just about every documentary I've ever seen on the Second World War and the rise of Nazi Germany, they do cover the push, but they gloss over it in about 30 seconds. Hitler tried to start a revolution, didn't work, he ended up in Germany. That's it. There's a heck of a lot more to what happened. This is a seminal moment that has not been examined before, and David has taken the time and the expertise to put this in paper for you to find out about. And it's essential. If you're studying uh, the Second World War, if you're studying history in general and why things happened, this is an essential book, The Trial of Adolf Hitler, The Beer Hall Putsch, and The Rise of Nazi Germany. David King, of course, New York Times bestselling author. David, I, I, we're going to run out of time in about 30 seconds, but I wanted to invite you back on the show to talk about death in the city of light, if that's okay with you. I'd love to have you back on in a few weeks. Would that be okay? Oh, wow. Well, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank, thanks, thank you for having me. Well, it's no, I want to thank you because it's essential that people understand what's going on in the world today and we look for precedent. And your book um, teaches and it tells the story perfectly. And, you know, evil really did walk among us, folks. And we've got to prevent that from happening again. I want to thank David King for his book, The Trial of Adolf Hitler. You just go to our website, you get it and order it right from the comfort of your own home. Thank you, David. I'm Brent Holland from The Brent Holland Show. The music's playing. Got to run. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time.